Okay, so um, Shalom, hello. Um, how is the sound? Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay, very good. I'm, I'm borrowing my daughter's uh, computer because it does a better job than mine. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I don't know whether this counts as my fourth visit to Israel. Um, I've been to Israel in the flesh uh, three times, uh, 2002, 2007, and 2018. Uh, so it is a, a pleasure to be with you. Uh, for me, it's the afternoon. It's two o'clock in the afternoon here in Nova Scotia, Canada, on the East Coast, right on the Atlantic. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to share my screen. I have a number of slides uh, that I will show you. I see my job uh, today as twofold. I want to talk about Newton's studies of the Jerusalem temple, uh, but I also want to showcase some of the archival holdings of the National Library of Israel in, in Jerusalem. So I'm gonna show you some images of manuscripts, Newton theological and prophetic manuscripts uh, from uh, the National Library of Israel. And they've been there since the late 1960s. So I will now try to share my screen. That works? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay, so let's begin. I want to uh, preface my comments today with some, uh, with some comments about uh, Newton's uh, uh, biography. Uh, he was born in Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire in 1642. As it happens, he was born on Christmas Day, 1642. And this um, is Newton, the first portrait we have of Newton. It shows him around the age of 46, just after he published his famous book, The Principia Mathematica. Uh, now I want to bring you with me into Newton's orchard. Uh, this is Newton's birthplace at Wilsert Manor. It's about an hour north of Cambridge, where he ended up. And this is a wonderful picture here, which shows uh, his home from his youth, and appropriately, a double uh, rainbow. This was taken by a Nova Scotia astronomer way back in 1980. It was just a nice coincidence that that double rainbow came up. So there is his house uh, again. And there is the famous apple tree. It's over 350 years old. They've dated it and it's still uh, flourishing. Uh, Newton ended up at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1661, right after the restoration of the monarchy. There had been uh, an interruption in the monarchy during the time of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, King Charles II came to the throne and that's why they call it uh, the restoration period. So you can see this is a very grand college uh, and this picture here shows it from the time that Newton uh, lived there. Now, um, we are uh, right now in the midst of a pandemic and a pandemic hits in the 1660s, uh, first in London, and then it spread to some of the outlying areas. And this engraving uh, shows some of the devastation of that uh, plague. It was the bubonic plague, otherwise known as the Black Death. And just as we're seeing now, uh, they had to institute uh, social distancing. And the University of Cambridge was closed down twice during this period. Uh, it closed down, and then it opened up again. And then they had a second wave, so it closed down again. And when this happened, both times, Newton went back to his home in Woolsort. And uh, he had just finished his undergraduate degree. He was in his early uh, to mid-20s. Uh, and he finds himself back uh, in Woolsort. And it's at this time that the famous moment when the apple fell happened. And this gave Newton some insights into universal gravitation. And there, is a, uh, some there are some apples there from one of the apple trees at uh, Wilsort Manor. So what we see is that the university closes twice in 1665 and 1666. And if you go online, you'll find lots of commentary about Newton's very productive Ani Mirabilis. That's Latin for his remarkable years, his miraculous years, or his wonder years. And 
this period of about two years, 18 months to two years, uh, was very productive for uh, Newton. Uh, the plague came to an end with the, the Great Fire of London in uh, 1666, and Newton goes back to Cambridge. But while he's at Woolsthorpe, he lays some of the foundations of his famous uh, calculus, a mathematical um, uh, production, and secondly, he carries out important optical experiments on the nature of light and colors. And as I've already mentioned, that's when he saw the apple uh, fall. And uh, this leads to a chain of reasoning that gets him thinking about the universal nature of gravity. He wonders whether the same force that draws the, the apple to the Earth uh, keeps uh, the moon in orbit around the Earth. And indeed, he was uh, correct. And this is what he said. He said, all this was in the two plague years of 1665 and 1666. For I was, for in those days, I was in the prime of my age of invention and minded mathematics and philosophy more than at any time since. They say that mathematicians peak around the age of 24. That's rather early. So uh, that's why they always recommend if you want to go into mathematics, don't take any time off after high school. You go straight into uh, mathematics. Um, one of the uh, fascinating things about this um, uh, this uh, moment is uh, what Newton uh, records about being in a kind of contemplative mood when he saw the apple uh, fall. And this is a, a rather important testimony. Uh, what we've seen uh, from research in recent years is that uh, it's when you're disconnected, um, also when you're out in nature, out in the country, that's when you can have some really original and creative ideas. And that's not what a lot of people are doing during the current lockdown. They are uh, very much connected, as indeed we are now. I'm not suggesting that you disconnect now. Please wait until the talk is over. Uh, but uh, there's a, a really good lesson uh, to be learned from this, that Newton was uh, was relaxed, he had an open mind, and he was able to have these very important uh, scientific uh, thoughts uh, during uh, the plague years. So he ends up back at uh, Cambridge, and he becomes a fellow, and there you can see his garden, right in the center there with the trees. It's a walled garden. Uh, it's his own uh, private garden, and it's right beside the Trinity College Chapel, and on the end of the chapel, you can see in Latin, domus mea domus orationis vocabitur. And this is actually a quotation from the book of Isaiah. Uh, so the context is uh, the words are directed to the eunuch and to the children of Gentiles who join themselves to the Lord and love the name of the Lord. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Some translations have all nations. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. Now, I don't know whether this uh, full passage was always in Newton's mind when he was thinking about uh, his studies on the temple, but it is interesting that that uh, engraving is on uh, the chapel. So he goes on to publish his very famous book, The Principia Mathematica, in 1687, and then in 1704, this time in English, he publishes his optics, his famous book on optics. And this is how Newton had how he achieved his fame, and his fame still largely rests uh, on that. Uh, however, uh, people are becoming increasingly aware of Newton's other projects, including his study of alchemy, uh, but also, and that is relevant to what we're talking about today, his study of theology, prophecy, uh, church history, doctrine, uh, the texts, uh, the Hebrew texts of the of the uh, Tanakh and the uh, Greek text of the Christian New Testament. And 
you won't be able to see this in any detail, and that's not the point. I just want uh, you to be overwhelmed with this very large collection of Newton's the theology manuscripts, uh, which can be found uh, in Jerusalem. This is a, a tabulation that I drew up with the help of a research assistant uh, a couple months ago. And uh, we have all the word counts, and uh, it is a very, very uh, large uh, collection. Indeed, it totals around 2 million words. So to put that in perspective, uh, the total co collection of Newton's theological manuscripts, which is strewn around the world, is about three and a half million. So the majority of Newton's theological manuscripts are in Jerusalem. Now you may ask, how did they get there? Some of you I know are aware of this uh, story. Uh, this is um, uh, Abraham uh, Shalom Yehuda. Uh, he was born in Jerusalem of an Iraqi uh, Jewish family and went on to become a world-renowned uh, scholar teaching at various institutions on both sides of the Atlantic. In 1936, Newton's uh, uh, non-scientific manuscripts were auctioned at Sotheby's in London. This is right in the middle of the Depression, and the Earl of Portsmouth uh, was on hard times at that moment, and he decided to sell these manuscripts. So they sold, and a large number of them were bought by the economist John Maynard Keynes. Yehuda himself didn't make it to the sale. He found out about it a few weeks later, but once he found out about it, he began to buy very, very heavily, making deals with other purchasers, uh, manuscript and book dealers, and he ended up with this large collection, which is now at uh, the National Library of Israel. Uh, he wrote some books, two books on uh, the ancient Near East. Uh, this book right here, The Language of the Pentateuch, and its relation to Egyptian. This is a, a copy that I own. He gave it to the Jewish uh, biblical scholar, um, Nahum Sarna, and you can see his letter uh, to uh, Professor Sarna. And this is another book that he published a little bit later, The Accuracy of the Bible. So that's A.S. Yehuda. Uh, this is one of the Yehuda manuscripts, and you can see that, uh, you may not be able to see it in a lot of detail, but in the upper left-hand corner, uh, there is a Jewish blessing, Baruch, Shem, etc. cetera. Uh, Newton did have some Hebrew. His Hebrew wasn't uh, of a scholarly uh, nature, but he did study Hebrew. His Latin, though, was fluent, and he knew Greek uh, quite well also. Now, in 2003, a documentary was released by the BBC, and it was my job, although I didn't expect this to happen, uh, to uh, reveal to the world that Newton had made a so-called prediction about the date 2060. So you can see the date 2060 about halfway down, just above that red wax uh, seal. Uh, this is the other side of that sheet. Uh, and this is a transcription where Newton is trying to figure out when the time of the end would happen. And in this particular calculation, he took uh, the uh, period of 1260 days, which he believed represented years uh, from the book of Daniel and the, the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And he added, uh, he took the year eight, 800 and added 1260 uh, to that to come up with uh, the date uh, 2060. Uh, this is the other manuscript, which has the date 2060 on it. Both of them are in Jerusalem. So the BBC documentary uh, showed me with uh, the, the first of those manuscripts, and then there was a headline uh, that went around uh, the world, uh, uh, first in Israel, and then it spread. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, there are 57 years back in 2003 uh, to the date 2060. Uh, in 2007, uh, we held a, ma uh, a manuscript exhibition at the National Library of Israel, and this is the guidebook. Uh, it's bilingual in Hebrew and in English. And this is the entrance uh, to that exhibition. And I believe that archway is meant to evoke uh, the Jerusalem uh, temple. And as you walk inside, you can see Newton's sketch of the floor plan of the temple uh, on uh, the floor. And there you can see some of the visitors to the exhibition looking at uh, Newton's manuscripts, which were placed on display for a few days. 
Uh, well, this event also uh, made the news. This is the uh, headline in Haaretz, the newspaper, uh, the English uh, version, Father of Modern Science Calculated World to End in 2060. Now, we had realized that there would be some interest in the 2060 uh, manuscript, so we were very careful in our exhibition to explain that Newton did not believe that the Earth was going to be um, destroyed, that a comet was going to strike the Earth, or anything like that. In fact, for Newton, this time uh, wasn't absolutely certain. He just believed that the time of the end wouldn't happen much earlier than 2060. And it's really not an end for Newton. It's more of a new beginning because uh, he believed that it would be around this time that the millennium would be established, a millennium in, in, in Christian terms, uh, kingdom of God on earth, uh, the messianic age uh, in uh, Judaic uh, terms. So despite our very careful um, qualifications, uh, the newspapers uh, nevertheless picked up on the 2060 date. Uh, this one is a, a slightly more sober um, and reflective uh, uh, story uh, that uh, talks about Newton's temple drawings. Now, I want to just flag some uh, scholarship on Newton's studies of the temple. Uh, Tessa Morrison, who is based in Australia, a student of the history of architecture, has now published two books. This is a more scholarly book, and this more popular book, Isaac Newton and the Temple of Solomon. Uh, also, a Spanish scholar, Morano, Morano Rodriguez, has published a full tr uh, transcription and translation of Newton's most important uh, manuscript on the temple. You can see Newton's sketch of the temple. That particular manuscript is now at the Huntington Library in Los Angeles. Uh, my colleague in the Newton Project, Rob Eiliff, in 2017, uh, published this book, Priest of Nature, The Religious Worlds of Isaac Newton. I encourage anyone interested in some of the themes uh, of today's talk to, to go to this book. Uh, it's very uh, well written and well researched. Rob is the editorial director of uh, the Newton Project, which ironically is not based in Cambridge, it's based uh, in uh, Oxford. Uh, Rob Eiliff uh, did come to Israel in 2018 also earlier in uh, 20, 2007 for our exhibition and conference. Um, I want to also point to some Israeli uh, scholars who have uh, worked on Newton. Uh, my Hebrew is, uh, I have some biblical Hebrew and even less uh, Israeli Hebrew, uh, but I know that the title of this book is Isaac Newton and the Temple. This is Eva uh, Lashem Ramati, uh, who uh, kindly gave me this book in 2007. Uh, it's all about Newton and the temple, and it's in uh, the Hebrew language. Uh, and this is uh, Ezra Harel's uh, Hebrew language book on Newton. And uh, there is the English translation. I was honored to help edit this uh, translation and provide an endorsement for it. Uh, it's a wonderful book because it takes you through Newton's uh, ideas on theology, but it also takes you through uh, Mr. Harrell's own voyage of discovery as he learns uh, more about Newton's uh, theology, Mr. Harrell being a man of science uh, himself. I encourage you uh, to look to those uh, books. Now, I want to set Newton's studies of the temple in their, um, in, in their original context of the 17th and 18th uh, centuries. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, what we're talking about here is an architectural plan that uh, holds true from the tabernacle through to the first temple of Solomon and the second temple uh, revived, rebuilt under the governor Zerubbabel after the return from the Babylonian uh, captivity. I should say the partial return uh, because many uh, Iraqi Jews, of course, came back to Israel in the 20th century, including. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Ezra Harrell. Uh, and then it was uh, renewed or, or renovated or even completely rebuilt by Herods uh, into the first century. So this is the temple uh, that is uh, discussed, mentioned in the New Testament. Now the third temple, well, uh, some scholars, some believers don't believe there will be a third temple. Some believers, some scholars do see a third temple. Insofar as uh, 
people believe in the third temple, they look to Ezekiel's prophecy, that is Ezekiel 40 to uh, 48. So this is a, an illustration of the tabernacle, and you can see there's the holy place, and then the most holy, the inner sanctum, where the Ark of the Covenant uh, is placed. Uh, this is an, uh, an attempt to reconstruct what Solomon's temple uh, would have looked like, the time of Solomon right up to its destruction in 587 uh, BCE. And this is at the Israel Museum. I took this photograph in November 2018, and it shows you the Herodian uh, version of the second uh, temple. Uh, this is what is, of course, called the Temple Mount. There is no temple there uh, now, obviously, uh, but uh, Newton and other believers saw the temple as being rebuilt in the future. Now, um, there are some interesting ideas about the temple that Newton picked up on, uh, two in particular. Uh, so the first one is that the Jerusalem temple was thought to be a representation of the cosmos. Uh, who believes this? Well, uh, the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, the Jewish philosopher Philo Judaeus, and many rabbinical writings take this view. And secondly, there is the argument that the Jerusalem temple is a representation of God's sanctuary in heaven. And we see this in the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, we now know uh, that uh, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, held that belief and some other rabbinical writings as well. Newton certainly held to uh, the first of those beliefs uh, that the temple was a representation of the cosmos. And he seems to have held also to a variation of number two. Uh, we'll get to that in a few moments. Now, Baroque temples. Uh, there was a, a real fashion in the 17th century to produce reconstructions of the temple. And so two Spanish Jesuits who did this are Prado and Villopando in their massive commentary on the temple in Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, they took the view that the temple uh, of Ezekiel's prophecy was more of an allegory, more of a spiritual uh, message, and they didn't see a literal um, temple to be rebuilt. Then you also have Jacob Judah Leon, who was nicknamed Templo, uh, a Dutch Sephardic Jewish biblical and Talmudic scholar who produced a, a recreation of the temple and uh, both of these works are much emulated in this period. There's a lot of discussion about architecture and its origins. So one view is that uh, the plan of the temple comes from God, and this is the foundation for all uh, later temples, uh, some of which were corruptions, but nevertheless, uh, this is the foundation for uh, temples and to a certain extent, all architecture. And then the Roman uh, architect Vitruvius, uh, his book uh, on architecture uh, was rediscovered in the Renaissance, and he put forward a more secular view that architecture had developed from the primitive hut. He had this notion that structures ideally have three qualities, stability, utility, and beauty. But some people combine these two views, and Juan Battista Velopando uh, was one of those. He believed that, in fact, that Vitruvius had obtained his architectural ideas from Solomon's temple, that Vitruvius was, in effect, a plagiarist. Well, here's the grand Baroque structure that Villopando uh, recreated on the basis of his study of the book of uh, Ezekiel and other uh, sources. As you can see, it looks very much uh, like a Baroque structure, it's like something that would have been uh, created in the um, early modern period. And of course, scholars then had no access, virtually no access to uh, archaeology of the ancient Near East and reconstructions of the temple. We've already seen a couple are much more accurate uh, today. Uh, but you can see that these are very intricate engravings. And you can also imagine how people would have found these endlessly fascinating. Uh, this is the top-down view. Uh, Villopando's reconstruction. 
And in the geometrical center there, uh, you can see the, uh, our, the altar of burnt offerings. And that's an important feature, which I will come back to. This is a, uh, a model of the temple, partly based on Villapando, uh, uh, partly deconstructed, but this is what remains of it. And it was uh, built in uh, Hamburg in Germany in the 1690s, sponsored by uh, a man named Gerhard Schott. And this model actually toured in England in the 1720s, in the last decade of Newton's life. Uh, this is a, another reconstruction of uh, the temple platform and the temple uh, by another scholar. So uh, this is in the air. People are interested in the temple. They're studying the temple. And they have various motivations for doing that. Uh, some people were interested in the history of architecture. Others believe that there were spiritual and mystical symbols in the Jerusalem temple that could be unlocked by a careful study. And others associated uh, the temple with their study of prophecy. And this is the most important starting point uh, for Newton himself. So here are three prophetic motivations for Newton to study the temple. Uh, number one, the Jerusalem temple was the scene. This is what Newton believed. It was the scene for the symbols of the apocalypse. That is to say, the book of Revelation, the last book in the Christian New Testament. And he believed that understanding the layout of the temple and its rituals would help unlock the meaning of this prophecy. So that is one of his motivations. Uh, but he also saw the dates for the destruction of the first temple, 587 BCE, and the destruction of the, so the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians under uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and then the destruction of the second temple, Herod's temple, in 70 CE by the Romans. At both moments, there is a dispersion of Jewish captives and this is why we still have a diaspora today, of course. So Newton saw these as demarcation points for some of his prophetic time periods. But Newton also believed, he didn't write as much about this, but he also believed that in the future, the temple would be rebuilt and that the Jews would return to their land. He wrote quite a bit about the Jews returning to, to their land, not as much about the future of the temple, uh, but this was uh, his belief. So uh, Newton, in other words, did believe in a third temple. Uh, he had some other motivations for studying the temple, uh, a general interest in the Bible. Uh, that's kind of a cavalier, uh, relaxed way of putting it. Uh, Newton was absolutely passionate about the Bible. He studied it all his life. And uh, John Locke, his, his friend, the philosopher, said that he didn't know anyone who knew the Bible better than Newton. He could quote it from memory. Uh, he uh, spent uh, much of his life studying the Bible. Also an interest in Jewish ritual and its relationship to the early Christian church. So this would involve the tabernacle and the temple worship services. Uh, there is uh, his belief that the plan of the temple mapped the cosmos. And number four, he has an interest in ancient, ancient metrology. This is the study of measurement. And this includes such things as the Roman foot. How long is the Roman foot? but especially the sacred cubit of the Jews. He's very interested in trying to find out how long that was because that will help him to reconstruct uh, the temple. Now, when Newton was a relatively young man in the 1670s, uh, he encountered the prophetic writings of Joseph Mead of Christ's College, Cambridge. Mead died four years before Newton was born, so they never met, uh, but Newton uh, did acquire uh, a copy of his works. So this is Mead's Clawis Apocalyptica, the key of the apocalypse. And this is uh, Newton's very own copy of Joseph Mead's works from 1672. Uh, it was a kind of an accident, but I discovered this at the Huntington Library where it had not been uh, fully cataloged. And it has all kinds of dog ears in it. Um, and I'll show you those after I just mentioned this uh, say something about this wonderful uh, fold-out plate. So this is Joseph Mead's attempt to take the symbols of the book of Revelation and put them on a timeline. 
So the arrow of time starts on the left and goes right through to the right. And you can see the Latin word finis there, which means uh, the end. So Mead and Newton uh, did not believe that the book of Revelation was merely symbolic and, mere, and merely allegorical. They believed that it would unfold through Christian history from the time of Christ right up to the time of the end, and also that there would be a 1,000 year millennium when Christ would reign uh, on earth. In fact, Mead helps revive this idea in the English context. Newton held to that uh, view. So it's essentially the same idea as a messianic age in Judaism. Here you can see one of Newton's dog ears, and uh, this is the inside of it. And so we're not allowed to uh, fold them because we want to preserve the, the artifacts. So uh, what we've been doing is creating these uh, virtual dog ears. And Newton would fold the page uh, to point to a portion of the text that was interesting to him. Uh, this is um, uh, from New uh, Mead's uh, works. And you can often cross-reference these uh, page markings to his manuscript. Uh, on uh, that page, uh, you can see uh, the Latin mele anos, which is just um, uh, to the right and above the point of the triangle there. That's a thousand years, a thousand years in uh, Jerusalem. This is the first page of one of Newton's earliest, in fact, it is, we think, the earliest treatise that he wrote on the book of Revelation. Uh, this is in Jerusalem, part of the Yehuda collection. Here's the same manuscript, Newton's um, uh, rules for interpreting the words and language of scripture. He believed that uh, the prophetic books of Daniel and the book of Revelation were written in a prophetic language. And you had to learn that language if you wanted to understand uh, the, the, these uh, prophecies. But Mead is also interested in the temple. He's interested in the measurements of the temple. He sees time periods embedded uh, in the proportions of the temple uh, architecture. Uh, he believes that the scene of the book of Revelation is the temple. So Newton picks up these ideas from Mead. This is from Newton's copy of Mead, an engraving of uh, the temple. And here you see one of uh, the Yehuda manuscripts and at the very bottom, upside down, and I'll give you that flipped up, uh, the Latin there says uh, the scene of the vision of the apoc apocalypse is Judea and principally the temple with its atria or its, its rooms. And there you see in one of the Yehuda manuscripts uh, a map of the Near East, uh, there's an enlarged version of it, and you can see that he has Jerusalem down there. You can see the Dead Sea uh, above it, Damascus, above that Aleppo uh, in Syria, and Baghdad and Nineveh are over on the right. So he sees the larger geography of Judea as being uh, the geography of the Book of Revelation, but in particular, the Jerusalem Temple. So here's one of the Yehuda manuscripts where he articulates this idea. The temple formed according to the proportions of the tabernacle, being the scene of these visions, of it that you may understand the visions better, I will first describe uh, the temple. And then in additional uh, places, he says the tabernacle or temple is the common scene of all the apocalyptic visions. For the land of Judea and therein the temple, is the common scene of all the apocalyptic visions. So you, you need to understand the geography of Judea, of ancient Israel. Uh, you need to understand the architecture of the temple if you're going to understand the apocalyptic visions. And the temple as being God's dwelling place and a representation of heavenly things is put for heaven. So you can see that Newton here is hinting at that second view of the temple that I mentioned earlier, which is held in the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., And then the scene of the visions to be Judea and in Judea, the temple. So this is one very compelling reason for Newton to study the temple because he wants to understand the apocalypse. 
here is a depiction of the great white throne with 24 elders bowing down. Uh, an animator has created this, um, this uh, image. So uh, this is the sort of thing that Newton is trying to do. He's trying to imagine the scenes of the book of Revelation and he sees in the symbols uh, various features of the temple, the trumpets uh, being part of uh, temple worship, the, the singing part of the temple worship, uh, the, uh, the fire, the altar burnt offerings, uh, the fire, the sea uh, mingled with fire. That would be the, the large wash basin with the reflection of the fire from the, the altar burnt offerings. So this is uh, the way he's thinking. Okay. Isaac Newton's temple studies proper. Let's say a little bit about that. Newton uh, looked to the, uh, the Bible uh, as his main source for the understanding of the temple, in particular, the descriptions that you have of Solomon's temple and the much more detailed descriptions of Ezekiel's temple in chapters 40 to 48. Now, Newton does seem to believe that there, there is a very close similarity between Solomon's temple and Ezekiel's temple. Not all scholars believe that. In fact, one of his followers, William Whiston, who I'll mention at the end, uh, did not believe that. He believed that Ezekiel's temple was, a, was uh, larger and, and different in, in many respects, and it was important to make that distinction. Um, but Newton also goes to other sources, uh, including uh, Maimonides, and uh, this uh, is a Latin translation from Maimonides, the Sefer Avoda, and uh, that uh, he had a copy of that in his uh, library. Now, the most important, the single most important manuscript that Newton wrote about the temple is his Pro Legomena. And this is the manuscript I alluded to it uh, briefly earlier. It is now at the Huntington Library, Huntington Library in just outside of Los Angeles. It's part of the Babson collection. And uh, it was moved there in uh, around 2006. Uh, this is uh, Newton's most detailed sketch of uh, the temple. And you can see it there. And it's very important for him that the altar of burnt offerings is in the geometrical uh, center. I'll come back to that, but you can see it's not just the temple, but it's also the entire uh, temple platform, the courtyards, uh, everything. Here is his sketch, a side profile with measurements of the altar as depicted in Ezekiel's prophecy. And then some other uh, sketches here, various architectural features of the uh, temple. So he spent a lot of time uh, looking at various sources, looking at the Bible, uh, looking at Jewish sources, any sources he could get his hands on to try to uh, reconstruct uh, the temple. Uh, here you see from the National Library of Israel a manuscript uh, about Ezekiel 40 and chapters following. Uh, you can see Latin there, but you can also see a little bit of Hebrew. Well, at least I can see it. You'll have to trust me, it is there. And uh, this is also from the National Library of Israel. So the, the really grand manuscript is in Los Angeles, but there are other manuscripts on the temple at Jerusalem. And this is one where you can see uh, some sketches, much more rudimentary uh, sketches, but uh, there they are. This manuscript also at the National Library of Israel, it has uh, at the top of the page there of the temple and synagogues of the Jews. So he wants to study the temple, but also the synagogues of the Jews. And this is part of his a study of church history and uh, prophecy. Uh, here are Newton's notes from Maimonides by way of this Latin translation, De Cultu uh, Divino. Uh, the manuscript there is a little bit um, faded, uh, but it has been preserved carefully at the National Library of Israel. And uh, it is now, as you can see, nicely digitized as well. Here you can see Newton's notes on Villa Pando. He didn't take too many notes on Villa Pando, but he was aware of his, his writings. And this is also at the National Library of Israel. Here you see 
again at the National Library of Israel, uh, a text and the, uh, the Latin there at the top of the page uh, says, uh, concerning uh, the length, the magnitude of the sacred cubit. So he wants to understand how long the cubit is. He needs to know that uh, because you need to know that to understand the dimensions, the true dimensions of the temple. And Newton was very interested in doing that. Uh, this one right here is in a private collection, but it's also a manuscript that has his calculations uh, from various sources of the length of the uh, cubit. Okay, um, the temple in uh, the world to come. Here's a, a wonderful chart. There are uh, various um, versions of this chart at the National Library of Israel. This is one of them. And what it is, is it's Newton's attempt to uh, create a schematization of the various symbols of the book of Revelation or the apocalypse. Now, you can't see the text in any detail, uh, but you can see certainly that there's a great deal of uh, care that has gone into producing this and I will tell you that time, the arrow of time, moves from the top of the manuscript uh, right down to the bottom. And here's a close-up of the bottom right-hand corner uh, where he's using language from uh, the book of Revelation, which also comes originally from the book of Isaiah, a new heaven and new earth. New Jerusalem comes down from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is... Uh, the Messianic Age that Newton sees coming uh, in uh, the future. And you can see I've underlined his uh, one example of his use of the word Jerusalem. And then at the bottom, uh, you can see the stamp of what used to be called the Jewish National University Library uh, with the Hebrew for Jerusalem. So it's kind of nice to see the English there, Jerusalem, and then Yerushalayim in the, in the, uh, in the Hebrew. So this is, again, one of the manuscripts at the National Library of Israel. So what Newton believes is that uh, in the future, uh, he is a Christian, uh, so he believes in the return of Christ. But unlike most Christians, he does not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. He believes that the doctrine of the Trinity is a corruption of the original pure monotheism. And it's very interesting because if you look at uh, Newton's manuscripts, you will see that he believes that the original religion, the religion of Noah and his family, was a pure monotheism that was untainted with idolatry. And uh, in his manuscripts, he talks about this early religion, and he says that the, the temples of these early worshipers were were meant to depict a heliocentric cosmos with the sun in the center. And the, the sun is represented by uh, an altar where fire is burned. Now, Newton doesn't believe that the first uh, religion was a form of pagan uh, polytheism. Rather, again, as I said, he believes that uh, the original religion was pure monotheism practiced by Noah and his family, but then over the centuries, it became corrupted and became polytheistic and lapsed into idolatry. Uh, so Newton believes this about the original religion, but he also believes that the original religion uh, recognized that there was a creator, that there was one God who created uh, the world and, and humans and animals and, and everything. And he believed that these, the priests of this early, uh, these early, um, this early religion, this early monotheistic religion, um, were both astronomers and also uh, religious priests. And they studied uh, the heavens. Now he's thinking a little bit here of the, the Babylonian uh, Magi, of course. Now, uh, he also believes in the seven precepts of the sons of Noah. So he believes that before the time of Moses, uh, the Gentiles uh, held to these uh, seven 
precepts, and one of them is to refrain from idolatry and to be monotheists. Uh, another is uh, not to be cruel to animals. Another is to set up uh, magistrates. So Newton uh, wrote about this, and this for him was the original religion that had become corrupted. So why am I, I telling you all this? Well, it's part of the science side of Newton's study of the temple, but it will also come back now to this uh, image right here. And Newton believes that the original religion is going to be restored. Uh, he is, as I said, a Christian, but he doesn't believe in the Trinity. So he believes that the majority of Christians have fallen astray and that the, uh, the true pure form of, of Christianity is going to be restored at the time uh, of the end. And this uh, would uh, happen at some time in the future, perhaps around the date 2060 or, or afterwards. Uh, here is another manuscript from uh, the uh, National Library of Israel. And it looks kind of messy, but I have a transcription here for you. And here we see Newton speaking about uh, the building of a new temple. This is Yehuda Manuscript 7.1c. The Israelites in the days of the ancient prophets, when the 10 tribes were led into captivity, expected a double return from captivity, and that at the first, the Jews should build a new temple inferior to Solomon's until the time of that age should be fulfilled, and afterwards, they should return from all places of their captivity and build Jerusalem and the temple gloriously. So uh, here is a place where Newton argues that the ancient Jews believed there would be two returns from captivity. There would re be a return from the, Ro the Babylonian captivity, uh, which happens um, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, a, a partial return, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but then that, um, First, that, that second temple would, uh, would be destroyed. Herod's temple would be destroyed. Uh, and, and that was in 70 CE. So there would have to be another return uh, to, to the land of Israel. So he sees two returns, um, including one that was still future from his uh, point of view. And at that time, around that time, uh, the temple would be built, a much grander temple uh, than even uh, Solomon's. Uh, he sees uh, worldwide peace being instituted. This is also from uh, the Yehuda uh, collection. Tis in the last days that this is to be fulfilled, and then the captivity shall return and become a strong nation and reign over strong nations afar off. And the Lord shall reign in Mount Zion from henceforth forever, and many nations shall receive the law of righteousness from Jerusalem and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up a sword against a nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, all which never yet came to pass. So what Newton is saying is that interpreters who believe that, uh, that the language that you see here from Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4, that it would be uh, fulfilled maybe in the church or maybe it was fulfilled uh, at the time of the return from the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Newton says, no, this hasn't been fully fulfilled yet. He believes it's going to happen uh, in the future. And here you see he's actually quoting from Isaiah 2 and Micah chapter 4 from the Huda uh, collection. Okay, now I want to uh, wind down. Uh, we've been going for maybe about uh, 45 minutes or so, so another five minutes or so, and, and we'll conclude. Uh, the reception of Newton's temple studies. Well, after Newton uh, passed away in, in 1727, some of his writings on prophecy uh, were published in this book, Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John, 1733. And there you see a printed version of that text uh, that is now in Jerusalem about uh, the return of the Jews, the double return, and the temple being built gloriously in the future. In other words, a third. Uh, temple. And also, uh, shortly after his death in 1728, the book that Newton was writing uh, uh, in his dying days, uh, The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, which is a history book about ancient empires. And in this book is this wonderful engraving of, uh, based on Newton's uh, sketches of the temple, which we've already uh, seen. And this one right here is a close up of the, the temple. And as you might be able to see, but I'll tell you if you can't, in the lower right-hand corner, 
uh, copyright uh, Jewish National and University Library. So this is actually uh, held by the National Library of Israel. This was part of the exhibition from 2007. And here's a, another um, in, engraving uh, from uh, Newton's chronology. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, again, I, I will tell you if you can't see it, uh, a scale of sacred cubits. And we've seen that uh, the sacred cubit is important for Newton. And indeed, in 1737, Newton's uh, writings in Latin on the sacred cubit were translated into English and published as an appendix to the works of John Greaves, who had actually visited the, the pyramids of Egypt and wrote quite a bit about the, uh, the cubit. This is uh, Newton's follower, William Whiston, who succeeded him at the Lucasian Professorship of Mathematics in Cambridge. Uh, Whiston not only was a convert to Newton's science, uh, but he was uh, an acolyte of his uh, theology and prophecy. And this is one of, this is Newton's uh, uh, sketch uh, time chart of the book of Revelation. And Whiston was much bolder than Newton, who did not want to make uh, firm predictions. Uh, but in this case, Whiston has actually calibrated the chart with uh, centuries. You can see going right up to the year 2000. This is from 1706, by the way. Uh, this is what Newton, uh, sorry, this is what Whiston, Newton's follower, uh, believed about the Jewish restoration. I observed that the restoration of the Jews to their own land in general and the rebuilding of their temple with the restoration of their sacrifices according to Ezekiel's description and model is not a thing of doubt or uncertainty in the prophetic writings but the thing that above all others, they everywhere foretell and describe in the plainest and most emphatical words imaginable. Now, what Whiston is saying, and this is uh, long before uh, Newton's death, uh, so the, Newton would have known about this text, is that the temple that is described in the book of Ezekiel, the temple of Ezekiel's vision, is going to be rebuilt. Whiston was absolutely certain about that, and he believes that it's going to be uh, a grander, uh, larger temple complex than uh, that of Solomon or Herod. Uh, this is uh, Whiston's um, uh, recreation of the, uh, the temple platform. And as with Newton and many others, the altar burnt offerings is in the geometrical center. Remember, Newton believed that that altar represented the sun in the heliocentric uh, solar system. And at the bottom, you can see some uh, engravings. There's a close up of the, uh, the temple, uh, even closer. You can see the altered burnt offerings there. And there's a perspective view of uh, the temple. That one's actually a little more accurate than uh, some of the other ones we've seen. Uh, this map was published in Newton's, sorry, I keep saying Newton, um, Newton's follower. Whiston's translation of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. And this is a, a sketch showing uh, Whiston. He's, he's the, the, the figure in black with a cane on the far right of this uh, sketch, walking away from the crowd. This is Tunbridge Wells in the late uh, 1740s, which was a resort town. And what Whiston did is he had a, he had a, a, a model of the Jerusalem temple belt in, in, the, in the 1720s, and he would take it on tour and he would lecture about it. And so this is one of those uh, lectures depicted here in this, uh, in this sketch. Um, just before I conclude, I wanna ask, answer a question that maybe some people will have. Uh, given Newton's interest in the temple, uh, was he a Freemason? Uh, the answer is we, we have no evidence that Newton uh, ever became a Freemason or that he was a member of the Rosicrucians. What we do know is that two of his supporters did become Masons. John Theophilus de Zagulies was the third Grand Master of England in London in 1719, and William Stukeley, who picked up Newton's interest in uh, temples, uh, became a Mason in 1721. So at least two of Newton's followers became Masons. Uh, but we have no evidence that Newton himself did. Okay, so I promised we would conclude and, uh, and, uh, about five or so minutes ago, and we are about to do that now, at least formally. Uh, what can we say? Uh, well, if um, you want to 
look more deeply into Newton's uh, theological manuscripts, I would encourage you to visit the Newton Project, the main uh, website of the Newton Project, newtonproject.ox.ac.uk. Uh, you can search the manuscripts using a search engine. For example, if you want to, you can search for the word temple and see all the times that Newton has used the word temple. We have about 95% of Newton's theological manuscripts uh, in transcription, searchable transcription. We're not quite there with all of them, but uh, in the next uh, year or so, we should have them all available. And uh, sorry, the bottom one there, uh, IsaacNewton.ca, is the Newton Project Canada, which I run here uh, in Canada. I have, a, have transcribers who do uh, transcription work, but all of that transcription work goes to the Newton Project website. Um, we're near the end of our funding cycle. Uh, we have almost completed the uh, transcription of the 3.5 million words of, of theology. Uh, we are still happy, of course, to accept donations. Uh, we can't provide tax receipts for Israelis, but we can provide US, Canadian, and British uh, tax receipts. And I've given you a, a sense of how much it costs to transcribe a, a single page. It's about 20 to $50 US, depending on how messy uh, the, the, uh, the, the text is. Um, so that's all I have to say formally. Um, if we were at the National Library of Israel, we, we would no doubt uh, be very close to the Ardon uh, stained glass window display. This is a picture I took of it in 2007, and I thought that would be a, a nice uh, and a fitting uh, end uh, to our presentation. Uh, in this stained glass window installation, uh, you see uh, symbolized the text of Isaiah 2, which we referred to earlier, uh, which is about uh, the uh, nations coming to, to Zion to learn uh, the law of the Lord. Okay, so I am formally done now. Thank you very much, Professor. That was fascinating. Um, there are many, many, many questions in the chat. I'm not sure we'll have time for all of them, but uh, we'll give it a go. <laughs> um, Mirala asked if uh, Newton knew Hebrew. Um, he did know Hebrew to a certain extent. Uh, he was by no means a Hebraist. Uh, there is a, a very useful uh, article that was published uh, a few years ago uh, by Scott Mandelbrot and Michael Jolan, um, uh, I think maybe about 2016. 2017, something like that, uh, where they, where they um, um, explain uh, the degree to which Newton understood Hebrew. Uh, he, was, um, he was able to, to write it out. He was able to even put the vowel points in. Uh, he, he could recognize words, uh, but he still had to rely on, on lexicons and, and grammars to, to understand. Thank you very much. Um, Bracha wrote a question in Hebrew, and I'm freely translating right now, so please excuse me if I'm not uh, precise. Uh, in what way did Newton's unhappy childhood affect his faith? And is his uh, suspicion or skepticism expressed in his theory about the end of the world? Well, there are some interesting theories about uh, Newton's childhood. Uh, the Historian Frank Manuel, in his 1968 biography, argued that because Newton was a posthumous child, that is to say his father died three months before he was born, uh, that he was perpetually searching for a father figure. And he found that father figure in none other than, than God himself. And this might help explain uh, Newton's belief that God is, is one person rather than three persons. Um, having a view of God that's actually, in some respects, closer to Judaism. Um, that's, that's difficult to say. Uh, you can't psychoanalyze Newton. He's been dead for centuries. You can't put him on a couch and, and ask him these things. And of course, many children who were posthumous uh, did not become anti-Trinitarians like uh, Newton did. But it, it's fair to say that Newton did face some challenges. Uh, his mother remarried and um, uh, it seems that he did not like his stepfather, who was much, much older than his mother. And in fact, uh, in a list of sins that he wrote at the time he became an undergraduate, he wrote 
He confessed that he had threatened to burn the house over his stepfather and mother's heads. So I think there was some childhood uh, anger there, uh, certainly. Uh, in terms of the, uh, his thinking about the end of the world, um, that was, I think, much more of a scholarly thing for Newton. Um, his approach to prophecy was very scholarly. Having said that, uh, Newton was raised in the, the English Commonwealth under uh, uh, Oliver Cromwell. And at that time, England was very Calvinist, and there was a lot of um, uh, writings about uh, prophecy and that sort of thing. So I think Newton absorbed that kind of thinking uh, when he was quite young. Thank you very much. Marion asked, uh, would Newton have been a Puritan? So we could uh, subdivide Puritan into Puritan with a capital P and Puritan with a small p. Uh, I would say that he definitely was Puritan with a small p. That is to say, he was very morally austere. Uh, but also, there are some uh, hints of the, the Calvinist uh, Puritan uh, thinking. Um, I've already alluded to this uh, kind of uh, revved up um, interest in prophecy that uh, occurred uh, during Newton's youth that it, certainly he would have uh, been aware of. So I think in some senses he could be called a Puritan. Thank you. Uh, Stefan asks, did Newton comment on Shabtite's V or his movement at any point that you know? I don't think he did. I could be wrong, but I don't think he did. Thank you. Um, there's a few more here. Uh, Masahiro asked, uh, what was Newton's view on Kabbalah? Are there any Kabbalistic ideas in Newton's theology or Jerusalem temple? So there has been a lot of discussion about this um, and the discussion has yielded different results. I have not uh, studied Newton's, his, I have not studied Newton's study of the Kabbalah in, in any depth. Um, but I'll refer to the work of uh, uh, Matt Goldish, uh, who's in Ohio. Uh, he published a book called Sir Isaac Newton and Judaism. And uh, he concluded that uh, Newton was, was not really uh, an advocate of uh, the Kabbalah. Uh, in that respect, he would differ from uh, Gottfried Leibniz, the German mathematician, who was his, sort of his, his nemesis. Uh, who was much more interested in it. Um, now we have to maybe distinguish between uh, Kabbalah proper, uh, the actual Kabbalistic doctrines, and Kabbalistic kind of thinking. And, and maybe uh, in the second sense, there, there is something to that in terms of his interest in um, uh, interpreting symbols, uh, his interest in uh, gematria, that is to say, uh, numerical significance in um, uh, names and such. Uh, most importantly for him, uh, the, the number 666 in the book of Revelation. So there's a little bit of that. But um, uh, I, I, again, I have not studied this in, in any depth. And, and I'm just uh, uh, giving you a summary of, of what scholars have said. Thank you. Um, Laura asked a question. Uh, Newton tried to look at the phrase, now this is Latin and I don't know if I'm reading this correctly, but mene mene uh, tekel, uh, a parison, the phrase written on the wall as a unit of measure. What do you think about it? Um, I think it's actually Aramaic, not Latin. It's definitely not Latin. Uh, it's, in, um, it's in the book of uh, Daniel. This is uh, Daniel uh, chapter five, the writing on the wall. Um, uh, when the Medo-Persian Empire uh, took over the, the Neo-Babylonian uh, Empire. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether he, um, the degree to which he saw that as signifying uh, measurements as opposed to uh, the judgment on, you know, it's weighed, weighed, found in the balance is found wanting uh, is how it's generally translated. Um, so yeah, it, he he has a um, an interest in it because it appears in the in the book of uh, Daniel. But I'd have to look more particularly at the 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 aspect of uh, measurement there. That's a very good question. Thank you. 
Thank you very much and excuse my um, ignorance. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that's just about all we have time for as far as questions, but I will open the microphones now so that people may thank you personally. Okay. Um, and thank you very, very much. Hope to see you very soon back in Jerusalem. And uh, thank you. It was uh, incredibly interesting. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And thank you for all the, the questions. Thanks for a great lecture. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, Steve. Hello, Yamima. <laughs> Good to see you. It's uh, Bob Hartman in Chicago. Much appreciated, Professor. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I wasn't expecting it to be interesting, but it was. It was fascinating. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for filling in many details. Hello, thank you. I'm David Baryakov. Yep. Yeah, I recognize you. Naomi from Toronto to tell you that you just opened a new door that I didn't even know that existed. Oh, good. Very happy about you, about it. And I just wanted to ask because I, uh, I want to send it to all my uh, uh, friends who are into sciences and don't believe in God, and we have some arguments on some level. Whether your lecture is uh, taped or where can I refer them to? I believe it's being recorded right now. Oh, it is? So how can yeah. I get hold of it? Um, I posted the link several times. I'll post the link once more in the chat room. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It thank was you. wonderful. Thank yes. you. The lecture will uh, be up uh, probably within uh, two to three days. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night or afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the world, and uh, hope to see you soon. Nice Please visit us on our site. And uh, I also uh, okay. put in. I also put in a, a survey in Hebrew for whoever has a little bit of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very good. Lecture. Okay, thank you. Philadelphia. Oh, hello. Thank you. I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hello, um, Professor. This is Lily Charles. Hello, Mom. Philadelphia. Museum. Yeah, I recognize you. Yep. Good to see you. Thank you, you too. Uh, how did you feel about, um, um, I mean, when you visited the museum, what did you see um, uh, which happened or something uh, relating to the this, uh, research of uh, Isaac Newton? Was there anything uh, that was related? Um, I mean, the uh, return from Sion, from Babylon to Sion, oh, yeah. and yeah, there were. I mean, there are a lot of things that are related to this research. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, Newton. You know, he died in in, in the year seventeen twenty seven. So he never saw uh, the the big uh, movements to return Jews to return to Israel starting in the nineteenth century. But I I am absolutely certain he would have been uh, beyond thrilled uh, to, to see this. And of course, the, the Babylonian uh, Jews being very, very important part of the, uh, the diaspora and uh, written about already in the, in the Tanakh. So he was very familiar with, with the Tanakh. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think he would have, I think Newton would love to visit your museum. <laughs> uh, and another question uh, the synagogues you said that he studied the synagogues and uh, so uh, I uh, I believe it were uh, there were uh, European synagogues not um, in the east or in Babylon or, or uh, other uh, elsewhere well what kind of where where were so, these synagogues that he studied? Yeah, so so Newton would have he would have been familiar with um, with synagogues in um, 
you know, in, in, in Amsterdam and, um, and, and in Northern Europe. But um, his study of synagogues involved uh, researching historical sources like Maimonides and, and so on. So he would have been also familiar with, um, uh, you know, Sephardic uh, and other uh, synagogues also, but not, not from personal experience, just from, from reading history books. Oh, yeah, I understand. Did he visit, did he ever visit a synagogue? Has, has he been to a synagogue? Um, um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know uh, that he did. Um, we don't know that he had any uh, extensive relations with, with Jews. Uh, some of his followers definitely did. So William Whiston uh, personally knew uh, Jews. Um, but so Newton's relationship with Jews was was more bookish. It was through books uh, and 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 uh, reading about uh, Jewish uh, worship and that sort of thing uh, through the various uh, sources that he had in, in his library. He's a very bookish man. We don't even know if Newton saw the ocean. Uh, he didn't. He didn't travel that widely. Uh, London. Uh, Cambridge and his hometown. That was about it. He visited Oxford once. He, was, he may not have even seen the ocean. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night, good day. Okay. Uh, Thank you. See you soon. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you so much.